All right, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Heroes Hype Holiday Series. I'm the source. Joining me is GL Phoenix, and hopefully, we'll be getting into some games pretty quickly for you guys tonight. Uh, GL Phoenix, how are you doing? I'm doing very well, thanks. It's great to be back here. It's a nice time of the year to have a bit of a bit of a little bit of fun. So I'm very much looking forward to seeing how some of these games are going to go. Cool. So our first game is going to be, let's see, Freights versus NA Lull. Uh, hopefully we'll get into that soon, get some invites going. But we've had plenty of uh, plenty of interesting things going on in the Heroes community towards the end of the year. The New Year patch, as well as a bunch of other announcements. Uh, what's been your favorite topic in the last few days? Because I know there's some juicy ones. Oh, I, I think one that I'll have to really this goes straight for is the one that everyone's been talking about is Garrosh loot well I'll just say he got a bit of a nerf losing the drag on his groundbreaker and it's going to be just a stun very de uh, divisive in the community some people really okay with it some people are saying he's a little bit too much and that he already had a decent amount of counterplay but it it's one thing that's going to be talked about for quite a while yeah, uh, that's that. I mean, it's a pretty massive change to come into a hero who's been around for a while. Um, we've seen a lot of different play with Garrosh, and we've seen how people have used them. So why make such a very large alteration to the change? Also, you know, we talked about this a little bit before we got going, but why not just nerf the E instead of the Q? Because E is really the you know really the punishing skill in the combo. Yeah, it's. I, I think. Uh, I'll as they mentioned in the developer comment, is that it was just frustrating uh, a lot of players to play around and it was just not entirely fun to play to have that kind of uh, strength in the kit. So, but yeah, as you mentioned, it is a lot with the, the throwing people around is where a lot of the strength is. The drag, we've, we've seen it with stitches. Like, yeah, you have follow-ups onto hook targets, but it's usually the follow-up that's the more damaging thing. So it's interesting that they've gone with this kind of approach uh, with the change to the Groundbreaker. But we'll, we'll have to see if teams are actually going to be willing to play him over the course of the day or, or if they're just going to leave him out and just uh, give it a little bit of extra time to stew on it. I still think he'll be useful. I think any good Garrosh is going to be able to get in range even off of the stun and get in your face. Because it's a... I mean... If you hit him at max range, it's a 0.7 second stun. If you immediately walk up on stun, I think you can still do the combo. And it also slows them by 30% for two seconds. So there's plenty of space in there, um, I would say, to be able to just kind of make that play happen. So I don't know. I, I, I think overall he's still gonna do he's still gonna do garage things, and we'll see if the dev team comes back to that as another change. Yeah, it's I, I believe they just wanted a little bit more room for counterplay and i think that little bit of extra time where it's forcing garrosh to close the gap instead of him just getting the gap closing for him uh makes it just that little bit of extra uh bit of extra time to allow uh, both sides to kind of uh have a little bit more to more uh thinking to do instead of just oh you've dragged someone in throw them over your shoulder and uh, then you're just trying to scramble to see how you're going to uh, recover from that. But yeah, as you mentioned, Garage with that uh, 0.75 uh, stun now on the Groundbreaker, there is going to be that, uh, that more than enough time for him to be able to walk up. And I, I'm, it'll be, I'm hoping that he still gets picked because I would like to see if teams are still willing to go with him and uh, if they're able to get it to work. But yeah, it's very interesting. But there are also some other changes on these patch notes that... Uh, quite notable that we were talking about a little bit earlier. I mean, Lucio, he did uh, get a little bit of damage uh, taken away from his amp it up. So when he uses that, he's going to be healing just that little bit less. And I think that's a little bit okay because he has been uh, one of the more dominant supports that we've been seeing over the past month or two. And he could use a little bit of tuning. Yeah, I can I can agree with that, especially since he's a manless healers. Manless healers get mm. a lot of free value out of uh, you know, any any skill that is consistent over time that requires no mana. 
uh, immediately transition over to another Overwatch character. Diva got an attack buff. Her auto attack damage has gone up. That's something that ticks at an incredibly high rate. It's only three, but three over the course of a long period of time might actually make her pretty formidable. Yeah, it, it's very much similar to like the number changes we saw with Lucio and his healing. Like we saw drops of just like one or two numbers, but with how consistently those numbers come out, it really does start to add up over time. And with that diva buff, sure, it's only looking like a few <laughs> damage here and there, but with her attack speed, I think you were saying it was like one point two five per second, or just some. She, she just attacks incredibly fast, so she's all consistently getting out those damage numbers, and it's just the amount of uh, things that o that are opened up because of that. I don't know. We could very well see her pop in. Uh, she's still not like a a main tank. She's just not that kind of hero. <laughs> uh, she she's still very strong in that uh, supplementary warrior role, but. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to see her be picked up at some point throughout the day, but we'll just have to wait and see. What do you think about Hanzo, just in in, in general, um, Ooh, as a Hanzo. pick? Because I'm, I'm still very torn. I think his... I would have loved to see... Same with both him and Genji, although the wall movement is a passive, I would have kind of liked to see it just like a built-in passive and not an activated skill, so that Hanzo could have had just to, like a little bit more going on in his kit, you know what I mean? Yeah, it does feel a little bit weird with the uh, with the agility, and he, he can get kind of caught out and be put into really awkward positions because of it. But I feel as though he needs that kind of uh, weakness. He, we, we've seen the amount of uh, mobility and just how annoying that can be on someone like a Genji who's always able to get out of there. Uh, regardless of how many times you hit him. But yeah, uh, just Hanzo in general, I feel as though he has... He, you're talking about being a little bit de uh, divisive on how you want to look at Hanzo, but I, I kind of agree. I mean, he has some really good strength. I mean, taking the, I think it's the serrated arrows at four, he can just clear neutral camps so incredibly quickly. He has a reasonable amount of damage in his kit, and the amount of utility he brings to the table can never be understated. All right, so we should be getting into the game very soon, guys. But before then, I want you guys to head over to the Match Arena for this event, for the uh, Heroes Hype Holiday Series. We've got two things, uh, aside from just the code, which I'll get into in a minute. There is a keyboard, and I believe it is a headset. They're both $30. Uh, I believe there are two of each of that. The admins will swiftly correct me if I am wrong. Um, and that prize money or that money spent on getting that cool gear will go into uh, helping out the prize pool. You guys can also go with the Macherino code. That'll add $1 for free. It doesn't cost you guys anything to be able to help support the event. And the code is H... Er, wait. H H H one. I thought it was one H H H, uh, but it is uh, three H's, lowercase, and a one, and that'll help you guys add to the prize pool. We appreciate you guys being involved, and we put these events on for the community. So anything you guys can do to help give back is great. Make sure you guys check out that code. Doesn't cost you guys anything, and we are into the draft. We're going to Dragonshire. This was picked, I believe, by uh, uh, Fratres. Yes, Fratres. Yes. So I called them Freights fans. earlier, and it just it didn't sound right. I, I knew I wasn't going to get it right. I'm bad with the names. Oh, good. So, yeah, Fratres banned Towers of Doom, and a lol banned Warhead, so that's not too surprising, to be honest. And we're kind of going to one of the more neutral of this of the maps. I mean, Dragonshire is one of those maps where it kind of, kind of tests all the fundamentals of team play. There's a reasonable amount going on. You have... Uh, it's a reasonable size, so you can play the Globals style of game with things like the Harker, Brightwing, or even the Falstad if you are so inclined. And uh, it, there's a lot going on that you can uh, kind of tailor the draft to how you want your team to be playing. Yeah, there's two schools of thought. This is a best of one up until the finals across this entire tournament. So you can either go with something safe or you can go with something aggressive when it comes to map pick. It seems like the safer map pick is going to be the choice. We've got a Tassadar ban, and we won't be seeing Garrosh this, this game, so we won't be able to see whether or not it really is affecting him. Uh, they're going to be taking that one off the board. Do you know who's on which side, though? Because I missed that. I can't remember who's on which side. 
I think believe, Zergling was on the blue side. I believe we're looking for NA Lol on the left. We'll confirm. <laughs> we will confirm, but the first pick has been a grey main. And yeah, grey main is just a very solid pick, especially high up in the draft, because he doesn't really give too much away. And he's very versatile, and he can fit into so many different types of drafts that you're not really giving anything up by taking that grey main right off the bat. Yeah, that and that is definitely NA Law on the on the uh, on the left side. ETC Lucio. So Lucio, despite nerfs being picked, I I think I think you were right that the healing is gonna have an effect over time, but Manalus Healer is just it's so free. It, it gives you so many more options in how you can play timings because you're not worried about waiting for your either healer to back and get mana. You can also do so much healing and rotation with Lucio. So I think I think there's something there. And then uh, Stukov to Haka. Interesting. And so they are looking to go for that global style of play with the Dahaka. So wanting to try and drag their opponents around the map. I mean, on the other side for the uh, for Frontrose, they do have an option with the ETC potentially taking a stage dive to try and match that. But we'll just have to wait and see if they want to maybe pick up something else. Maybe uh, even the Brightwing could even come in here as a potential secondary support to try and shore up some of that uh, hit to Lucio's healing and also play um, a little bit of extra global game. And also with uh, on this current patch, Brightwing got a bit of a buff to her Polymorph. It uh, costs a little bit less and it has a shorter cooldown. So if there are going to be things like a Greymain diving into your team trying to assassinate those squishy targets, uh, the Brightwing can be very good at dealing with those kinds of heroes who want to go in and want to just take out targets really quickly. Yeah, I definitely I definitely see where that would work. And I actually like that as an idea to add more crowd control to the team fight as well. So you're you're taking you're taking the additional healer, but you're getting a lot out of it. You know. Mm. Or Uther. Like it, it, it kind of feels like it's it, you could kind of fit that into the sort of this global Uther point where right when we ha we'll have some clear we'll have some crowd control um there's a couple of options there malthiel and murden going to be removed to taking one of the tanks off the board as well as the best tank killer so maybe that means we're going to see a you know a very beefy uh composition coming out from na law since you can't really solo tank to haka and he's definitely going to be their split pusher so they'll want something with that rotation yeah, they will be more than likely needing another tank, as you mentioned, Dahaka. Not necessarily the best when it comes to solo tanking, so there are still quite a few options on the on, options available, things like the Arthas or even the Diablo if you're so inclined. But just getting rid of that mood and not wanting that very solid frontliner to be uh, on the table, whereas on the side of front rows, they pick up the Sony and the Valor. So the Sony is going to be the one who's going to be uh, more often than not dealing with that Dahaka on that top side of the map or whoever is going to uh, whichever way they want to be put in that solo lane and the valor is just a very consistent damage threat who well she's just consistent she has been consistent for quite some time and she's she's still very good uh, despite how the meta has come and come and gone different styles tend to stick around but valor is still a very consistent damage threat Vala may not always be good, but she is never bad. Same with Falstad. I feel like Vala, Vala and Falstad, they've got these very strong core MOBA kits where, I mean, Falstad would be out of meta and you could see somebody take it because Gust was so good. Vala could be out of meta, but you could take her because she was safe and had consistent damage. Um, I think that Sonya in the top lane makes the most sense. I, I agree with you on that one. It's a good matchup for her into the Dahaka. She pretty much wins that once Poison Spear comes online. Uh, Li Ming being added to the damage rotation along with the Johanna, going to give them okay clear. Uh, maybe Janna would have been better, but maybe Li Ming, Li Ming is there for the comfort and for kind of some of that burst damage. So what do you think the last pick is from the side of Fratress? Hmm. Very interesting because they have left it reasonably open. They could go for a secondary support or even just go for more damage and just try and uh, blow some targets up and that's essentially where they're going to go with they're going to finish off with the genji so yeah it looks like we've got resets on both sides the leaming and the gray main uh if they go diving in and start picking off some of those early kills they can just snowball these uh these team fights but on the other side if the genji starts slicing and dicing through a team it can very well go south for uh nal so it'll be, it's gonna be very interesting to see how these team fights go 
All right, and they lull with a little bit more of a stick and move composition, post up, do what needs to be done, and then move to the next objective where it seems to be all speed and mobility. Everybody on the side of Rogers has at least one gap closer minus Lucio, but you know, he's he, he gets to move he gets to move expediently. Uh tra traverse traverse the map at a high speed, so he'll be able to help that team rotate into position. We are into game... Well, this is actually the only game. These are best of ones, I keep forgetting. We are into our first match. It's going to be NA Wall. They'll be in the blue. Frontress will be in the red here at the Heroes Hype Holiday Series. Thank you guys for joining us. Make sure you guys check out that Match Arena code uh, one more time. The code is HHH1. That'll add a dollar to the prize pool. Help support the event. Which composition do you think you like more, Phoenix? Ooh... I, I I looking at the NA LOL lineup and it, it covers a lot of bases really well and it has a lot of fallback options. So if they do end up dropping behind a little bit early, they start dropping a level or two, they do have uh, options to try and play the map. They can uh, try and avoid fights. But then again, on the other side, the Lucio for front rows can kind of force teams out of positions to just speed boost to uh, catch people and just force a fight. So I'm kind of liking the NALL composition, but it's going to be very interesting to see how it ends up going. All right. Let's see if there are any interesting uh, initial talents, just just because. Um, let's see, pull this up, Accelerando. Swift as the wind. We do have a pause momentarily. Uh, I believe. Oh, looks like someone didn't connect, so it'll take them a second. All good. Let me just. All right. Well, while, while, while we've, uh, I feel like we've broken down the game game just enough. Let's talk about other heroes of the storm controversies. Let's let's set some things on fire, make some people uh, mad. Uh, what do you think of ranked? Let's just open with that. Oh. We may not finish this conversation. I don't even think we'll come close. We'll we'll, we'll come back to this over the course of uh, over the course of the broadcast, ladies and gentlemen. We'll 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 get into some of the juicier topics going on. But let's talk about ranked a bit. Yeah, it's it's been a bit of a fiasco. I mean, it started out with the whole uh, performance uh, based adjustments, and they mentioned that a lot of the problems that we're currently seeing were kind of independent of that. But it's it's hard to just to fully detach us, detach ourselves from the whole performance based um, adjustment, but uh, that system in and of itself, I like the idea of. But just with all these problems, it's just not given it the best of sh showings right off the bat. Yeah, it's been it's been tainted by association with the issues. Which I've had conversations with people about it. And it to to me the the issue with just what uh, everybody having issues with placements, them having to reset the placements twice, and then doing the rank adjustment that's come out today. I mean, I, I think everybody needs to 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 take take a chill pill and just understand how much code goes into the game. If you've never coded, then you really don't know like one semicolon out of place in a C++ bit of programming destroys the code like <laughs> like that's step 1 for first everything has to be grammatically correct in terms of the language you're programming in and then things have to logically be correct it has to give you the effect you want you may have sent some information in the wrong place so these these things happen. They've also been fairly, you know, open and candid about how badly it was a screw up. So I, I think the Heroes team has done a good job trying to fix the whole thing. Yeah, I, I'm I'm hopeful for how the rest of the season is going to go. It, it's been a very bumpy start, but as you mentioned, they've been all right Four, about it, and three, I'm just hoping that two, one, uh, the community isn't going to give them too much. Well. Grab for it, but we are into the game. Everyone is back into it, and we're getting right onto it. Yeah, both teams stepping out into the middle of the lane, not looking to slow down the minion waves at all. I don't. Oh, instant drag by the Haka. Some good initial damage. I don't really think that'll connect. Nice silence onto ETC, but he will slide on out of there. Plug goes in. Spin to win. A little aggressive, a sleepy bear. But it seems like both teams should be able to clear out safely and begin their er, initial rotations. 
And is that Gen? No, oh, no, that's Sony going top. I thought it was Genji going top. <laughs> yeah, just a little bit of uh, light training back and forth. Is it nice? Stan goes down onto the Grey Man, but doesn't manage to get out of there in time. There's enough members in there. It looks like he might actually get turned around on them. Don't yeah, they'll be out forced out. That hurts. Uh, they did get the clear in the bottom, though. So that was a 3v4. A little bit of advantage off of that. That's a good pullback in. Decent condemn from Sirius. Slide by Hyperion. Doesn't connect. And uh, they'll put they'll put some counter pressure back just because they had to have Li Ming rotate down to start trying to clear. Their clear is okay. It's not great. Instant play onto the Giants. The mercenary changes have definitely picked the pace of, I think, how teams are rotating now just because... Mercs have just got so much more value, or at least have these different types of values you can kind of capitalize on. Yeah, just those additional uh, benefits that each of the camps have, it makes it so much, as you mentioned, uh, they just bring more value, and it, and also with the normalization of, uh, of uh, timings, of objective timings on pretty much all maps, is that it, it's a, allowed teams to better uh, structure their uh, early uh, camp takings, and, we do have the first shrines uh, now available as finally goes very low, takes a good amount of damage from that gray man. Is. Now we're just getting a little bit of contention on the point, but it's just trading back and forth and been very scrappy so far this game. Yeah, these teams willing to skirmish. Uh, it will be advantage towards NA Law for the moment. Vala taking a little bit too much damage and CO not being in place to be able to heal him. Bird person will rotate back down, put some pressure on Hyperion. And I think I think you're right, the, the normalization of those timings, not just allowing for teams to really you know, open up new strategies behind it. But it, I think we're finally starting to see the true potential of what Heroes of the Storm has been has been driving to be for a long time, which is how you play each individual map strategy really opens things up. And now we can see it, you know, not necessarily always on the pro level. These guys are, you know, definitely good at the game, but they're not at the professional level. These guys are looking to aspire to that, looking to grow to that. Um, and the fact that they can start to think about those strategies, these things have been normalized, I think is you know, a great evolution for the competitive scene in general. Yeah, and not only that, it's just on, on some of the other maps where you have, like, just look at Curse Hollow, for example. It's like If you know in advance where something is going to be spawning, it, it allows much more uh, fall planning, and it allows teams to actually think, as, as you mentioned, just like, think on that next level and uh, do at least get an idea of what goes through the minds of some of these pro teams and it, it's really quite nice that, they, that they've gone through this whole normalization of timings for that reason it just makes it allows it's one less thing to just try and guess what's going to happen but as we keep this early game is not really having too much happen it's just training back and forward with the Sony pretty much controlling the top side while NLO is doing a lot of Damage on the bottom side is Seo takes a lot of damage as a, a Stukov is actually going to be the first victim of this game as the Genji does manage to slice through him as it looks like they are going to be forced back as they don't have the healer anymore. They have to be very careful as now the Grey Man is looking to be the next target. They doesn't have much health left as the Genji goes in, does manage to take him down. So it's a nice pick up there for the side of Fratres and they are going to have control of both of the Shrines for just a little bit. Yeah, this will give them a nice experience lead. They may even get this Dragon Knight as well. This counter back uh, to all the pressure that was being put in bottom. Their rotations have been cut off. They couldn't really do a whole lot off of uh, that very early camp take in the bottom. The Knights are just so much more difficult to deal with. The spell armor coming off the caster uh, in the night camp just makes that difficult. And that really gave NA Law an advantage in that, uh, that push down there because it's just hard to clear off of that. But now Dragon Knight in the hand of Protres, they can now pressure more than one lane a little bit of pressure there on the hyperion a lot of damage in that's a great silence the hungering arrow was hitting serious but that's rarely enough to make him turn off it's going to be the lucio joining the team that makes them stop and uh they may actually lose a guaranteed keep in mid that could bring things up to a clean level lead for the side of fraud race and that could mean 10 going into the next dragonite phase yeah they already have a, a reasonable uh, experience advantage but at least a level in to be honest, it could, they could be, I, I think they could be utilizing this Dragon Knight just a little bit better. Yes, this fort is uh, still vulnerable and it will actually go down, but there's a lot of extra experience that could have been taken care of. A lot of experience uh, is in those towers and probably could have been uh, using that Dragon Knight to deal with those, but they do manage to get that fort. They are expanding their uh, experience 
advantage and they as you mentioned are going to be getting to level 10 pretty pretty soon and we'll be able to use that for the next phase all right play towards the top half of the map zergling has uh had not necessarily the best time i mean it's at the haka it's very hard to truly pressure him out of lane but he has lost one tower and uh, there is another one low as well full team rotation or four team four man rotation here up into the top lane to guarantee that last bit of experience. Meanwhile, they've left Genji down in the bottom. Seems as if they have abandoned the bot side on the side of Fratres and have just accepted the fact that that's not, nope, full team rotation down to the bottom. They want to fight. Yeah, and that's one of the things with Lucio. You can very quickly rotate as the stage dive that is actually going to be used. Not in the best of positions. Doesn't get too much out of that. So that is going to be, a, I believe, just a little bit of a wasted opportunity. So, but they don't actually lose too much out of it. They're just going to be uh, going back to their lanes, trying to get that experience late, but they're not able to make the most of their heroic advantage. Yeah, uh, a, missed, a missed play, a missed opportunity, pretty much off of an inefficient rotation. There wasn't a lot of value to be gained in going top, and they kind of committed a lot of people up there, but the bait in Hyperion is there. He won't have the mosh, but he did take stage dive. He still has some CC. That's a silence on him. Nice rain of vengeance in from the top. Kronos, they're cutting down to the bottom. They've actually got them all pinched in here. That's a good flail to keep uh, Klug out of there. Down comes the sound bearer. Now they're being pressured. Bird person into the back line. Sleeping bear with the dragon blade. He actually missed that one. He got healed back up, but he will eventually finish off the Li Ming. He's going to dash himself out the camp. We'll go over to the side of NA Lull. But uh, Frogchairs will walk away with the kill, so they'll take the experience advantage. And now they need to get somebody top, because that night camp is getting some experience back in favor of the blue side. Yeah, in the end, this is going to be a little, to, just a little bit of a trade of experience. The kill for the camp, I mean, you'd probably want to uh, be wanting to get the kills, but I, I guess you'll be taking that consolation prize. They, as you mentioned, they got kind of got bait in there. They wanted to take that fight, we, even with the Tahaka coming on the back line, with a great isolation going down onto the Genji, but they weren't able to make the most of it as they hit it. So they weren't able to get that fight in their uh, favor right off the bat, but they do. NALOL are going to be grabbing this bottom camp, and they're going to be putting a lot of pressure on the bottom side. As you mentioned, this night camp is uh, quite strong, and it's going to be a bit of a pain to deal with. But, and it's going to allow NLO to do, uh, put a lot of pressure. They do go in for the fight. This cross takes so much damage. The healing is starting to come out, but it's just not nearly enough. It doesn't actually go away as Kronos is... Uh, Lucio is going to be the first victim of this fight, and they are going to just take that and then use this to just put all this pressure on the bottom side of the map. A great blast shield sets up uh, pretty much that whole play, and at the start of that, before that even happened, it was a good thing that they'd taken advantage towards the bottom, because NA Wall was able to secure themselves that bottom shrine, which means there isn't a sneaky dragon knight behind them. They can keep the Haka top to fight that Sonya and maybe guarantee the dragon knight goes in their favor. They took the knight camp, everything was just kind of set up in a nice domino effect for them, and they will now take that inner wall. They've got the talent advantage. It won't be there for long, but this will set them up to start looking for the next Dragon and Knight play, and they've kind of equalized the, the, the losses they had in giving up the first Dragon Knight. Yeah, they were put down a little bit earlier on, but as you mentioned, they've brought it back there dead even on experience, and we've got a tight, essentially a tie game at this point. We've essentially traded forts on top and bottom with the ETC and also the Sonya just pushing down on that top side while all that pressure was being put on the bottom side, so it's just trading experience here, there, and everywhere, and it looks like we're trying. It looks like Frontos are trying to make a play for the Dragonite. As the Genji is almost going to be able to get it, but does use the sub ability to get out of there just in time. But they still maintain control of both of the altars. A mm, little bit of pressure towards the top, though. They're going to send two Sleeping Bear and Hyperion, looking to finish off Zergling. He's going to use the Essence, heals himself back up. His team is now there, and this is going to be a difficult position. If Sleepy Bear gets caught out, he's actually going to flip over the wall. Now Hyperion might be in trouble. He's going to get isolated, gets dragged back in, is taking a lot of damage from Li Ming, Bird Person, throwing out the skills. Klug is there to try and slow them down. Actually decides to go back in. Now Vala may be in a little bit of trouble. She'll be fine. Klug now running away from Pumpkin Slayer. Nice Blessed Shield comes in. Here comes the fallout from Bird Person, Li Ming, dishing out the damage. Sleepy Bear did dash in there. Look to try and put some pressure onto a target. That one kill will let them open things up again. They've got the Haka taking the shrine, and it looks like NA Law has advantage for the moment. Yeah, it was almost like a very delicate dance that the Johanna was trying to uh, trying to play because she knew that if she moved too far forward and showed herself uh, 
in that fight that the Valor on the bottom side would have been able to take that Dragonite and it would have all essentially been for naught but a nice uh, dance there from the Johanna being able to be impactful in that fight as you mentioned with that blessed uh, that hammer or not the hammer the shield and also uh, deny that potential capture of the Dragonite so very nicely played there from NLL they do have a, a, a nice little bit of an experience lead and they should be able to get uh, two at level 16 and that talent here advantage uh, in time for the next fight, I guess. Yeah, good series of picks. They've also had the Hawk uh, soaking up any remaining experience. Night Camp uh, picked up by both teams. So whichever team deals with that first, uh, we'll, we'll see who gains advantage. They've actually got Johanna up here. The Hawk is waiting down on the bottom. He should be able to cancel out the Genji, no he doesn't, and now it's going to be a fight, Kronos takes a lot of damage, here comes the stage dive, Burr person is out of there, Pugman Slayer the only one in, the, the flailing swipe is going to knock everybody back, nice condemn, and that's a great isolation, onto the ETC, he's going to get dragged back in, despite getting that sound barrier, it doesn't help, here's the Dragon Blade, Sleepy Bear looking for targets, they've got a good spin in there from the Sona, he's looking for one more, and he finally picks somebody up, he should be able to dash himself out of there, now Zergling is uh, in a little bit of a difficult spot, doesn't get the drag on the Kronos, though the Vala should be able to walk away from that, she did get condemned back in silence down from the Stukov, and it looks like both teams will trade out 1-1, and again, nobody's going to pick up the Dragon Knight, and it's going to be time to clear out all of the minion waves, unless they let Stukov do this, they time's going to be difficult, a bit of no, time. I don't think won't. they'll be able to get it. Yeah, the amount of time taken for Dehaku to fully tap capture that shrine, it gave enough time for Fratres to actually get up there and essentially just defuse that situation. But yeah, that fight, it was it was very close on both sides. You looked like we could have had a few more deaths on either side, but it ended up just as a one for one. And we're getting some very, very interesting team fights with uh, Genji doing very good damage on that backside, but the isolation is doing so much work in, well, it does what it says on the tin. It isolates a target, and uh, NLOL have been doing a very good job of dealing with those targets as they uh, isolate them. And yeah, actually, we, we do have the Genji diving in yet again. Sirius taking a lot of damage. It's going to be forced all the way back. Gets the healing from the Stukov, but they are going to be forced back just a little bit as this uh, Greyman is in a very precarious situation. He is in enemy lines, and he is in... A very bad position and he is going to get locked down there's absolutely nothing he can do and this is going to be a clean kill and also that means that that bottom camp is going to go over to the side of Hunter's essentially for free yep they'll get a kill and a camp and uh walk away happy also have some time to clear out those bottom minions and it's actually a pretty big minion wave it is on the death uh the death bridge up in top lane to huck will clear that one out so uh, that won't really go anywhere, but it does kind of draw the forces away. And the timing on this kill, this should be a Dragon Knight. They should be able to easily bully away this Johanna series. Shouldn't be able to stick around for very long. And it looks like they're going to be putting Klug into the Dragon Knight. No, they're waiting, deciding. Should, Klug should really just channel that before Genji has to do anything crazy. Genji will... Uh, Put a little bit of pressure on that to Haka, but he actually has to get Ooh, out of there. Nice. He gets isolated. This could be bad for him if he gets pulled flips Ooh. over the wall. Has the backup. They're actually even going to stage that. They want this pick. They want to be able to kill him while the rest of the enemy team has to deal with that Dragon Knight. Four people show up, and one to Haka goes down. Now it's going to be a Dragon Knight in the bottom and advantage towards Fratres. Yeah, it was a bit of investment using the stage dive and... <laughs> Essentially, everything that they had in the general vicinity to take care of that Dahaka, but that does nullify that potential uh, soaking game for uh, NA LOL. So they don't have the Dahaka dealing with those other waves and trying to get them back into the game when it comes to experience. And as you mentioned, this Dragonite is a reasonable threat at this point in the game. They've already taken down this fort on the bottom side. They're going to start moving towards this keep. And that's a lot of experience left in the towers that they can, they can pick up and... Uh, pretty much slingshot themselves towards getting to level 20 very well ahead of NLL. All right, we're 15 minutes in, three seconds on to Haka. Uh, I don't think this Dragonite's going to get them more than... Actually, they're not even going to try and take the keep. Dragonite is going to go... The Hyperion now in trouble. This chase continues. I don't think they'll be able to get in range, and the members from Frachase will walk away from that. But a great series of plays and great defensive uh, flailing swipe from the Stukov. 
Yeah, they sure it did kind of uh, save the Sonya a little bit, who was at a very low HP, but it did end up helping out in the end. And as you mentioned, getting rid of that Genji was so impactful, and it was just a very solid uh, chase out of their base. And now that with that death on to the side of Front Row's uh, NLO, they're just looking to take down this kid. They want to start setting up those advantages, but we are, it is actually going to be calling out the stage diver. Now we want another fight, but without the Genji, that's one of their big targets not in the fight, the Johanna takes a lot of damage, is going to be forced out of it, but they are actually going to be forced away just a little bit. They want to take down this keep, but have to be careful that they don't overextend, as this Genji has now respawned, and that is the signal for NALR to back away. Yep, and they're going to be able to walk away with the keep. So taking that camp uh, was the nail in the coffin. It was the little bit of extra damage that they needed. I think they could have played a little bit more aggressively. But they decided to take it fairly slow. Now Clug looking to re-engage on this. Wants some revenge. He's going to put a lot of damage on the series. He's now half health. They won't be able to step onto the game. Instantly gets removed. The ball is gone. Out comes the Blessed Shield. Silence. That's an isolation onto one of the tanks. Genji is in the back line. Sound barrier was good. It is going to give them some space to maneuver. But I don't think Hyperion is going to walk away from this one. So much damage comes in. Here comes the resets. Li Ming is low on mana. Ooh, no drag from Dahaka. Zhongling doesn't connect that. But maybe this is and there's actually still one of those giants down there it's keeping the minion wave in the base there's another set of giants oh. coming if they fit oh if they pick off clug as well they should be able to just end the game here got plenty of time before two members are up and they've got more than enough damage i think this is over they do have the heroic advantage for just that little bit of extra time and i don't think there's enough uh in the in the bank for Frontress to get their own. There is literally no mana on the side of the Liam Ming, so that's one hero that's not really being all that useful in this fight. The damage is going down onto the core, but they're also losing health quite rapidly. The nice healing comes out uh, from the Stukov, but is it going to be enough? The Greyman actually falls. There's, they do actually take down the Sonya, but do they have enough damage left in the tank? All that's left is the Dahaka, the Sonya, and the Stukov. They're trying to finish it off. The Siege Camp is doing all that it can to help out. They do manage to finally finish off that core. It was a little bit sketchy at the end there, but NLL do take it in the end. It was dangerously close. Maybe a little bit more focus fire. Uh, from, I mean, the Grimmin was dealing damage to the core, but maybe you could have focus fired down the Sonya and they would have been a bit safer. But it will be NA Lol taking that win. Uh, they make a good come from behind after what was a very seesaw uh, first match of the day. And uh, let me take a quick look at the brackets. Admins will likely tell me who we've got, but I'm just curious. Uh, first match, first match of day. Nope, nope, not that. Wrong button. We'll figure this out. No one can see this, but we'll figure it out. Uh, okay. So, uh, ooh, we actually have a purchase. So somebody did purchase the headset. Uh, Laval, thank you for picking up the headset. Shout out to you. Uh, for helping support the event. Make sure you guys are putting in that Matcherino code, code HHH1, to help support the event. $1, uh, $1 codes will go into adding the prize pool for the teams competing. It doesn't cost you guys anything, just a little bit of time, a couple of keystrokes. And our next match is going to be... <laughs> it's going to be NA Law versus E. Kevin looking for a girlfriend. Uh, that meme is never going to leave that, man. Ah. Oh. Uh, feels feels is he coming on that team? He better be actually on that team. It, it, okay, it okay, it's he Kevin and Etobi. I was gonna be really. It was gonna hurt a little bit. <laughs> if, if it wasn't him, it's gonna be like that team. Uh, but because and, and he's people... there, it, it's all good. It's all good. He's there. Okay. He's 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 owning up to it. He's just gonna own it's, it. It's uh. See, here's the here's what's gonna happen. What or here's the question. What happens when he gets a girlfriend? Like can't be that, that that can't be a default team anymore like even if he's not on it like it can't it's just not true for a grand final we can go with that one i oh. guess you, you can keep oh. the name bro. all right all right all right that's, that's, <laughs> that's okay um yeah that in in terms of the bracket uh it's gonna be na wall versus ekem looking for girlfriend uh in other updates those guys or no, they they gotta buy and so let's see who Ah, Warthogs beat Trademark Gaming, starts with an R, Trademark Gaming Red. So Warthogs will be up against Oh My Science. ODI is going to be up against uh, Lego My Ego. And 
Don't know between Team Caliber and uh, Moto, so still waiting on that one. And as soon as the admins send us that invite, we'll get into games. So why don't we get into some more fun Heroes of the Storm topics? Uh, you got you got any you got any other news you want to get into? Um, we could keep on talking about ranked. I mean, that that's a topic that we could talk about for. Oh yeah, we we can we can get in, we can get into ranked a little bit more. Uh, I mean, performance based matchmaking is an interesting concept. I still haven't played any games with performance based matchmaking because I played my placements and then I played my placements again and then I played my placements again. Um, so I still haven't actually gotten gotten a good idea of what that looks like. I was talking to. Um, Zeus from Team Liquid a little bit about it. He was talking about how he was playing Nova and how Nova's stats were tracked. And it's it's interesting to track each hero stats individually. I just wonder how those are really determined. Yeah, that was actually one of the um, criticisms that some of the other people I was talking with like had towards the system is that yeah, it, it's each hero has kind of a general way that you play. And you will be essentially judged based on what the majority does. So why, uh, one of the criticisms was why would, uh, what's the point of a system that will punish people for deviating from the norm? Yeah, that's, that's, that's definitely a fair one. Not to mention the fact that what the norm is may not even be the best option for the hero. It may just be what people find easiest or most realistic to play. It also depends on, is it bracketed by ELO? So is your, is the play style of, you know, the play style of a gold player is very different than the play style of a platinum player is different than the play style of a diamond, of a grandmaster, of, um, you know, of a master. So are we looking at Nova play for golds? And when you're in gold, you get bonuses based on that. Are we looking at Nova play overall? I, I actually think it'd be interesting to see what it would look like if you did it by whatever uh whatever your general rank tier was because then Um, because then you're seeing how the character actually evolves of the course of play across different skill levels and you can actually look at that yeah i think they mentioned that it might have been done in that way where it's there's a lot of blogs i I just haven't gotten through all of them and i'm just (laughs) kind of trying i've been waiting to like play it and and mess with it myself yeah, that that was my idea. It was like I I want to just like try to just see how it feels. But yeah, with this whole <laughs> reset, reset, reset yet again, haven't really had the. I I'm in the same boat where well I did a couple of placements and then it got then I saw that we were gonna get reset. So I was like, okay, I'll just chill on those for a bit. Just wait for the next, wait for the reset to happen. Wait till it's all like settled down and then I'll do placements. And by that time, it was performance base was already kind of shelved for a little bit, so I haven't had the chance to actually experience it myself, but yeah, it's it's an interesting concept, but yeah, it didn't really it hasn't really had the most favorable of uh, first showings because of everything else that's been going on at the same time. I don't know, I rank, this, rank systems are always very difficult. I I, I'm a firm believer in like the the good old hard MMR system. Mm. Like you've got you've got a like just, you just have a number, number, and that number is what you are. And here's what the good numbers are, and here's what the bad numbers are. And you know, a, a win is worth X, and a loss is worth X. And if you beat somebody higher rank than you, you should get more. Like. The, the most yeah. adjustment should be like based off of relative skill level. Yeah, that, that, that's it's, like, it's harsh. It's that. really harsh, but like, it's it, to me, it's as fair as possible. Hmm. Um, because it, it's 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 just it's hard. I I the the innovation of the systems I think are making for a more inclusive, more stable ranked experience. Yeah. Um, just like. Starcraft 2, like Starcraft 1, just good old leaderboards. So sometimes I miss it. Yeah, it, it, it's just like just thinking of all the different games, like competitive games out there and the different way that they handle ranked. It's 
it, it it's hard to it's never a one size fits all when it comes to rank systems. Yeah, like, I mean it's it's a complex games, issue. Yeah, and like different game genres require different like they have different requirements for their ranked systems. And it gets a little bit more complicated when you do team games. Like with an ELO, well, an ELO or MMR system, it, it's, it's reasonably easy to uh, sort out such a thing when it's like a 1v1 uh, kind of game like StarCraft. But when you take teams into account, there's a whole bunch of different numbers being thrown around. The whole system ends up getting a little bit <laughs> jumbled a bit. And it, it, it can get a little bit messy. Yeah, no, it's... It's a complex issue. I just wish I could simplify it. Uh, I also miss Duo Q. Just give me back Duo Q. Oh, as someone from a smaller region, like I'm from Australia, as someone from a smaller region, I would so love getting Duo Q back because it is a lonely experience to play uh, Hero League in a smaller region. Yeah, I like I, again another thing. I understand how that works and why people want you know mm. why people get angry at duo q um but at the same time i just i i feel i feel when it comes to ranked that playing with one other person is fine but three people is not a team like to me three people is not a team five is a team yeah uh, like five five is what a team is maybe, maybe you could even say four you could you like four and five are team play. Everything other than that is playing with friends. Because if I don't have like people say yes, it's three fifths of the team, so you've got you know the, the over, overall kind of control thing. and the majority. But like in a team game like Heroes of the Storm, if I don't have control of all five people, then it's not a team. Like like that's not. I wouldn't consider that team play because those two people could be like that could be my support and my tank and if you i just support my tank, worry, no, i just yeah. like not like if 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 my muradin and my morales are not in sync my muradin's gonna dive too far my morales won't be able to heal him and then my muradin's gonna die or like my etc is gonna slide but my etc should not slide and it's just yeah. like the you know the the word goes beyond the 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 point of recovery for the healers so the healer has to step out of position like those two you know like every role is so critical um in heroes of the storm like every piece kind of has to be a part of the puzzle that you know